speaker, um, it's Dimitri or Dimi. Uh, he is from Ocean Protocol. Um, they're building a new data economy, so unlocking data and data silos. So this is super compatible with uh, a multi-chain network like, uh, like Polkadot. So um, he's definitely going to get into to how the two can integrate. But more importantly, Ocean Protocol is uh, hosting a, a crowd sale tomorrow. So if you like the talk, maybe uh, you can, you can you know, <laughs> buy, some, buy some coins. Um, <laughs> but 10% uh, of everything goes to me. No, no, I'm kidding. Um, it all depends on me now, right? <laughs> I think I, 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 I managed to copy paste the link on a MacBook. It's an achievement. Hi everyone. Um, well, when this pops up, um, we can proceed. Let's have a sip. Right one. Some point. So yeah, um, my name is Dimitri. I've been working previously on, um, I think we started with something called Ascribe uh, with some other people right here. Uh, and then we moved to BigchainDB and now we're verging towards Ocean Protocol, which is kind of like an extension of previous thoughts. And here I'm kind of talking about um, how it would look like to, for us to integrate with uh, Parity, but also uh, with Polkadot and also giving you a bit of like more, uh, are you into for some more technical stuff or more like high level stuff? I was thinking some technical stuff, so uh, yeah, okay, fine, perfect, good. Um, so yeah, what do we do like, uh, and what's all the commotion about? Um, well, a lot of data sharing and yada, yada, yada. Um, actually, why I'm doing this is something else. Um, let's imagine you wanna create a, a very cool DAO, let's call it the DAO Llama. Right? Um, I ripped this off the internet, so uh, I should have accredited. Um, but, well, well, let's see. Eh? Let's give it some eyes. Eh? So, w w what do you want? You basically want to do some object recognition, right? Um, if you want this thing to see and recognize patterns, then you probably are going to use some pre trained uh, convolutional neural networks, trained maybe on something called ImageNet, which is a huge data set of images. Um, and, and then, yeah, then you can actually recognize objects, right? Um, but you want to go a step further. You also want to add some auto captioning. So what you're going to use here, you, you're going to use something like recurrent neural networks or long short-term memory things. And then you're going to have uh, something called word to vec which is basically how to map words into a vector space. And then suddenly our uh, Dao Lama can say, well, hey, I can see four giraffes in this plane. And that's this auto-captioning thing, right? And you'll see you'll have some image data providers, some, some neural net providers, some, some word data providers, et cetera, et cetera. Now, let's see what, uh, let's, let's make it here a bit. Um, so let's talk about speech recognition, right? That's, again, similar things. You want to have a recurrent neur neural network there. Uh, you want to have a huge database of speech. Um, and then you can hear stuff. And then maybe you want it to also respond, have its own Twitter feed, like uh, I know Simon has a few of those bots running around spamming the Twitter net. Uh, and then you're going to use something like hidden Markov models, a plurality of providers there as well. Uh, you can generate text, it becomes very creepy, these machine learning things. Especially if you say, well, uh, what if it's an artist, right? <laughs> a bit like Dali or something. And then you can look at these generative adversarial networks, which are pretty, pretty creepy. Uh, that's what they use for this deep fake stuff. Uh, it uses style transforms. Uh, you, can have, you can basically, from uh, quite plain uh, rough sketches, you can fill it in with very real world-like images. So, again, you want to have people knowing about uh, these GANs, these uh, generative adversarial nets, and again, make them a provider into your system. So, imagine this Dao Lama comes to life, and then in the end, what he wants to become is something autonomous, right? Uh, something that nobody owns and controls, and then he's going to give a lot of love to people that feed him data and, and nets and, and compute power, and that's kind of what I thought when I was building Ocean Protocol. Uh, so this kind of goes aside with the public messaging we do. It's kind of my personal uh, uh, thing uh, that I added to the system. Um, so 
you could say this Dao Lama is actually a data service supply chain, but aren't we all data service supply chains or uh, parts of it? Uh, so you, you, you have all these providers coming in there. Uh, typically you need like three components. You need data, compute, and then uh, uh, maybe some algorithms that uh, run that compute, right? And then you can feed it to the next stages of your pipeline. So this is basically how you would make an, how I would make an app on Ocean Protocol. Uh, something like this. Now, we need a lot of components here. Eh? It's a very heterogeneous space, a lot of providers, a lot of di different types of data, compute, models uh, that we want to provision. So we need to split this up to make it a bit more congestible. Um, so we kind of call it an inter-service network. Eh? So we kind of want to glue existing services together into these data service supply chains, or maybe you can call it uh, solution supply chains, depending which angle you're looking at the problem, right? Um, so think about bigger market stripes um, where a lot of providers are. Could be Web 2, Web 3, Web 2 and a half. Um, currently, what we figured is a lot of the data, a lot of the UX and the data scientists are still in the Web 2 world. Uh, it's hard to move them over to stuff like IPFS eh, because there's like just not a lot of traction. You have TensorFlow, you have Kaggle, you have all these existing frameworks. And, and, and so we kind of have to accommodate also for Web 2, right? Not only Web 3. Um, but as you can see, we're working at the service layer. We want to connect all these services. Now, what's an ideal protocol to connect uh, blockchains? That's Polkadot. So we see this as basically a, a level above Polkadot, using that inter-blockchain communication protocol uh, to connect to all these types of Web3 services. And then we can use stuff like Chainlink and other type of oracles to connect to Web2 services. And, and, and really focusing on these data orchestration pipelines. Um, from a component point of view, uh, we have a consumer where we try to take care of the UX. So we're basically, we're working a lot with these data science things like, um, uh, what is it again? Um, Jupyter notebooks and all these types, types of things. It's a Python-driven environment. It's moving a bit more into the JavaScript space as well. Uh, so most of the drivers you find for Ocean Protocol are either Java, JavaScript, and Python, because we think that's where our users or consumers of these, these applications lie. On the other side, well, we, we kind of have this Web 2 and Web 3. Web 2, yeah, there you're looking at cloud providers, on-prem systems, uh, permission clusters, all these things. And they have, well, they have the resource, but they have their access control and policies around that as well. And then Web3, well, that's Web3, right? If you have, can send a transaction, you basically are granted access to that service. And you're thinking about IXEC, Enigma, uh, Filecoin, all these type of things. If you have a wallet, you can access a service. Uh, and then in the middle is where we added a few components to make this a bit more digestible. Um, I guess there's three main parts. One of them is what we call a decentralized metadata store to just find your data, find your assets to store them uh, as the metadata, not the actual data itself that stays like on the provider side. And then we have these things called service execution agreements, our smart contracts. We made modular. Um, it kind of, we'll, we'll dive into that later, but it's basically how the, the policy between the consumer and the provider. And then on the bottom, we have verifiers that kind of uh, want to check whether those things that should have happened in the service agreement actually happen. Um, and one of the components we're using there as well is called the secret store from Parity. And that's basically, you could call it a proxy or encryption network using something called uh, Shammer secret sharing for doing like cluster-based uh, encryption. Um, and now we have one missing component which glues these two worlds together. Uh, from our side, we have Web2 access control uh, for the Web3 into blockchain communication. We're using Polkadot uh, as a relay chain. So that's kind of the setup. And now we have to wire all these things together, right? Uh, what I'll do is I'll go into a few of these uh, components more in depth uh, so you can see what kind of the decisions in our architecture were. We made maybe have some comments or some suggestions. That would be awesome. Um, so first of all, it's something we would call a decentralized data DNS. This is kind of the DNA we inherited from BigchainDB, which is a blockchain database. Uh, it's quite similar here as well. We're using a decentralized data store. Um, it's, uh, it's 
not too fancy, but uh, the interesting thing is everything is labeled with a decentralized identifier using the DID spec from uh, W3C decentralized identities in order to make it a bit more global accessible than just within our metadata store. So basically you could go to any identity ledger implementing that spec and drop your meta metadata there. So for us, assets are identities in the system as well. Um, and the only thing you have to do is find a way to resolve the asset uh, or that, that, that identifier into the actual metadata. So you can go both ways. You can query, find the DID, and you can, from the DID, you can resolve the metadata. The second part, um, that's uh, where we use uh, the most of the Solidity code, and we call it service execution agreements, just because it makes a sea and oceans and stuff like that. Uh, what it has is it, it makes that you can take this agreement, um, you can make it modular, you can add in kind of what your terms and conditions are in order to fulfill such an agreement. And it connects every consumer with every provider. So every stage in this pipeline would have an agreement attached to it. Um, the cool thing here is uh, it can then be used as access control for Web 2 and Web 3. Um, but it, can also, it also has built-in verification. And you can play with incentives. And you can put incentive structures within these agreements at the right locations. Um, and then the third part is actually saying that, well, we're not going to provide all these services. We're going to glue them together. So we're going to create uh, an ocean relay chain that's trying to bundle a lot of these uh, interesting Web3 services that are already out there into our ecosystem. And then, of course, the messaging protocol that we're tending to use is Polkadot. Um, and also, of course, the verification pool that uh, such a relay chain offers. So I think the most exciting part of, of what we've built so far is these service execution agreements. Um, let me give you a bit of a rundown of what that actually means, what it is, how we built it, um, how we implemented it in Solidity, and etc. Um, so most of you know things like service level agreements, right? That's where an internet provider says, that, hey, I'm going to have so much uptime, and if not, I'm going to give you an Xbox. Um, there's even like servers that are uh, out there for 24 years, kind of, that's kind of the highest I found. Um, so that's kind of highly available. Um, and then there's also recourses, right? If, you, if AWS has a downtime for, uh, a, what, what is it, 1%, and they're gonna pay out 30% of Amazon credits, which are tokens, of course. Um, so yeah, what we're building is not, it already exists, but then on the, on the silo side. What we're really interested in is, of course, is data service solutions. And, and we're talking about machine learning, AI, and they also have something like SLAs attached to it. And there you can be very clever. Um, you could, for example, set up a bounty, saying, that, hey, uh, a bit like Kaggle or something. Kaggle is a framework that a lot of data scientists are using, and saying, hey, I'm gonna put out a bounty. If you find an algorithm that performs so well on my hidden data set, I won't reveal that, uh, but you can submit maybe once or twice a day, then you get a bounty. Well, that's super easy to set up with these service execution agreements. You make a bounty contract, you say, this is my performance function, and off we go. Um, what are service levels in machine learning? Well, typically it's about, hey, how do you specify the metadata? How do you specify the input formats? Uh, but it's also about what's the accuracy, the performance function, and privacy. Privacy is an interesting beast. Um, let's say a, a, a private data set and, 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 and an algorithm, they walk into a bar, they're having a cocktail, get, getting a bit touchy, um, and the data provider, uh, the algorithm says, hey, I'd like to train on your data. Oh, uh, the data provider says, I, I cannot reveal my data. Oh, shit. Um, oh, yeah. Would you then run my algorithm on your site? I don't need to see the data, I only want to see the res response of your data. Yeah, I could do it maybe, maybe in homomorphic encryption mode. Okay, and then they're negotiating and getting to a, a data date or something. Um, what we recognize here is that a lot of data doesn't want to move. Data wants to stay where it is. There's a few reasons. Uh, privacy is one, but also the sheer volume. There's this thing called the FedEx bandwidth. At some point, it's cheaper to take out your hard drives, put it on a truck, and move it across the country than 
pumping all the data over the wire. Like, data just has a lot of inertia. So that's something we learned from talking to a lot of data scientists. Um, so often what you're going to do is you're going to bring the compute to the data. So you're going to say that, hey, you have a data set. Hey, can I throw my algorithm in your data set and come back with a result? And maybe also an attestation that you actually run my data, uh, my algorithm on your data. So that's, that's another topic that we're very interested in. How can we prove that a computation happened somewhere off chain and then come back with a result and that that result actually ran on a data set? Um, and there's a lot of interesting techniques going from snark starks uh, to something they call PCPs. Uh, you can go into multi-party computation and a lot of other crypto tricks, which always do, do one thing. They kill throughput and bandwidth. And, and, but that's, that's going to get solved, right? Um, there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong in this, in this data date. Eh? Uh, the request wasn't sent, wasn't delivered, something went wrong in the middle, uh, etc. A lot of unhappy paths. And what do you do with unhappy paths? You, oh, yeah, you do something else. Uh, here I just want to show that, well, we're kind of moving away from this typical service level agreement into, uh, those errors were predicting it, um, into what we call maybe uh, Web2 service with oracles. Like, we just saw this chain link thing, and there's a lot of cryptographic material you can add, and then you can prove maybe a certificate or a TLS session. Um, you can maybe have staking and voting an incentive on was it actually that Oracle truthful. If you go a bit further, it's still Web2 services, but you attest with proofs like CK Snarks and other things. You can also, you can publicly verify that that actually happened. Um, and then if we go one step further, we go into decentralization, which means that we're going to have uh, a lot of replication of the computer, we're going to have deterministic stuff running, etc. So we're basically looking at the full spectrum of types of services and how to prove that that service actually ran. So we, we, we're going to deal with a lot of proof types, a lot of condition types, and we're not going to make all those proofs ourselves. We're going to basically repurpose them or connect from other networks. If Filecoin has a proof of space time, we're just going to connect to Filecoin and see whether that proof ran and got verified. And that goes then into our service agreement. Um, these agreements, well, they're kind of, we, we want to make them modular. We want to say that, well, everybody has zone terms and conditions. So we should make it that these agreements are composable on chain. So you'll have one smart contract that has the ability to create a lot of different variants of these service agreements with different terms and conditions, different types of rewards that you can plug and play. So th this is where we spend a lot of time on in maybe the last few months. Um, I'm very bad in copy-pasting these things. So um, the, main, the main idea is that we're going to work with a challenge and a proof. We call it a condition and a fulfillment of that condition. Think about a condition being, here is a hash. Find me an ounce that hashes to this hash, right? And that's, you put something out there on, the, on chain, for example, uh, that says, here is a challenge. Try to solve that crypto challenge. Here is a public key. Find me a signature. Um, Here's a multisig that needs to be fulfilled at threshold, etc. I'm going to show in a few seconds how, how these things actually uh, reconcile to something useful for machine learning. Um, but what I also want to add is that these challenges can also add rewards to them. If you solve this condition, you get the reward. If you fulfill that condition, you get a reward. That's kind of how we can create very dynamic contracts um, and, and we can play with the types of rewards play with the types of conditions, etc. The condition itself, we try to keep it very simple. Uh, it's, it's just a state transition. It goes from I don't exist to I exist and nobody really touched me to I exist and I have been cryptographically fulfilled or a timeout uh, appeared or something like that and, or somebody found an anti-proof um, and, and I go into aborted mode. And based on these things, these things you can create what we call these service execution agreements. So what you see here is, well, everybody here in this, on the left side, they all have a task. A uh, um, consumer uh, has to lock up tokens. Uh, a curator has to discover a service. A verifier has to verify the, the service delivered. 
uh, a provider has to provide a proof that he actually did the service and that's then going to be verified by the verifier. And based on the combination of, of the outcomes, of the fulfillment or the condition, what state these conditions are in, you can create reward functions around that. If you do this and this and this, you get this reward. If you do that and that, you get another type of reward. So now it's going to boil down to well, a few more things. Um, we want to, we're kind of um, into the privacy mode these days. So we kept a lot of the data off chain and we put it in our decentralized metadata store. And the stuff we put on chain is content at rest, uh, has access control on each type of condition, and is actually only taking care of the, of the state's change. So this thing, these things are stored on chain as just a hash and a state. And they also have a type of condition they're gonna, they're gonna be, uh, you can have a lock reward, you can have maybe a signature, a hash, etc. So what we kind of created was a service bus where people can put these challenges in through these agreements, and then others can fulfill these challenges and redeem the reward from that challenge. And you can make combinations between those and compose, uh, etc. So a bit of these compositions. At the core, the simplest ones we have are called hash, a signature, a threshold, and a query. For a query, inter-blockchain communication or chain link is quite interesting. Um, you can compose these into more complex types. For example, uh, a multi-sig, um, but then also payment types and access control. Access control we currently are doing with, through uh, proxy re-encryption networks, sharing session keys, making sure that uh, if somebody wants to consume that session key, that they need to access uh, get access granted through the proxy re-encryption network, which will then flag that, hey, somebody accessed it, and we get granted the access, and now we communicate with this contract. Uh, there's a lot of more details in, in, in our GitHub repo if you're interested in one of these things. We can compose into more and more uh, advanced things, like, for example, uh, if you have hashing and multisig, you can do something like voting. If you have payments, you can make stake. You can make escrow uh, rewards. You can build full oracles out of these queries. Um, and then you can go one step further into composing these into full DAOs, uh, curved bonds, uh, other types of network rewards. And that's what we are playing now with, like different types of conditions and different ways to compose them into an agreement. So one of these things you can do is, for example, a simple escrow or stake agreement saying that, hey, I'm gonna lock payment. If you grant me access, I'm going to release the payment. And if you and better ac give me access to, to that resource before a specific timeout. We can do also like uh, things with signatures, etc. Uh, this is quite free floating. Um, so what we are doing for, for the end user is composing templates out of this. Things that already exist and you just say that, hey, I just want to have a simple payment or I want to have a stake or I want to have a lottery or something like that. Um, now, what we, an interesting part is that all these events, these conditions, might have different types of verifiers coming from different networks from which uh, we don't really want to, we're never going to have the traction by, as a single company to make this happen. So we're relying on a lot of other networks to provide verification proofs and attestations. If we're all going to push this on Ethereum main chain, it's going to be a bit uh, high throughput. So, hence looking at parachains to make that validation happen in a parachain and having efficient uh, communication purposes as well. Um, so this is a typical way you would set up a sidechain or a parachain uh, doing all the verifications of these, of these services. Uh, as last, uh, I also want to see how we built in incentives or at least playing with them. Um, so, I'm going to go back to this Dao Lama. Um, and he's connected through these service agreements with a lot of services, and they keep him alive. Um, and now this Dao Lama wants to basically pay back. So what we did is we take these service agreements and we can put them in bonding curves. Um, if you're not familiar with bonding curves, uh, Simon is there. He can always explain you what it ex exactly is. You can convert these Cs to, to NFTs. You can put these... NFTs under a bonding curve. Um, 
you can add lottery functions, minting rewards, and you can start composing interesting value chains. Maybe you want to put this into under, uh, if you know the asset value, you can maybe create a CDP out of it, create a stable coin, uh, really make it, trying to make it flexible. Like say, this is the work or the access you have, and this is the reward you can get. So that's kind of a few of the things we're playing with. Um, yeah. It's very exciting. It's also interesting to see how these uh, modular compositions play out and what's kind of the optimal uh, scenario there. So, well, we're maybe a little bit of, about the stuff we're doing next, um, mostly coming from research. Um, so, we're spending a lot of about verifiable access control on Web 2.0 uh, because that's where the data is, that's where the data scientists still are. Um, and, and a lot of things there are in research and we have some elementary protocols ready. Um, and then we're also looking at how can we prove that somebody run a machine learning algorithm uh, on a service that's not replicated? Uh, can you prove that an algorithm got trained, got tested on a hidden data set? And then of course, uh, sidechain oracles, like communication between sidechain, opening the web uh, tree connection. And then in the end, we're also spending a lot of time in things like bonding curves and incentives and a combination. Uh, we will soon have a little blog post about how you can short sell bonding curves, like creating negative signals uh, and actually short on a bonding curve. There's some, some tricks that we still have to do, but a shout out to Paul, Kolhas, and then Simon for reviewing and giving input. Uh, we're also playing a lot around these incentives that we've built into the system, and now we need to test them, right? We need to run simulations on them. We need to see how does this play out to security audits. And then we're also building more like front end stuff like uh, commons that data marketplace, funds for data, funds for algorithms, all that. So I think that's kind of it. Um, I'll put these slides online as well. So there's a few links of, of more details of each of the components. Uh, and then you can look it up uh, and maybe contribute or leave a comment or something like that. That would be nice. Uh, yeah, that's it. Um, have a great evening. Maybe there's a few questions. Do we have time left? Yeah. They're in the back. Hi. Thanks for the talk. It's very rich. Um, I'm more into machine learning and data science, and you have been presenting a very funny way uh, with a dialogue between the algorithm and the data uh, to talk about federated learning. And I would like to know how far you are in the implementation of this uh, federated learning, and you know what kind of uh, MPC, like the multi-party computing, do you use, or do you make use of some library like OpenMind or whatever? And yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, uh, so the, I'll repeat the question. Um, I, I'm, we, basically, we're presenting a form of federated learning uh, where the learning happens where um, multiple data pockets and then gets cut, like um, some top somewhere. Uh, um, the question is what kind of uh, techniques we are employing. Uh, one of the things we're focusing most on is on-prem compute. Uh, we have something uh, that we call FitChain, which basically is um, try to secure Docker containers, uh, have them vetted, and they spit out like intermediate proof types or challenges. Uh, it's something custom we're developing. Um, we're also, we've been in contact with people working around Starks and Snarks. Um, what we found there is that for training purpose, for extracting gradients and doing back prop, that probably won't work on the short run, but to evaluate an algorithm uh, with a sample that might then well work. Huh? Um, other things like open mind, yeah, for us that's kind of like, it would be a, a, a no-brainer to look at how far they are with uh, MPC or homomorphic encryption and then tr tie it in as a service in the network, attach them to a service agreement and just use what they already have and leverage it in more complex rich pipelines. We're also talking with the guys at Enigma, uh, which are also on the side of MPC and looking into like secure hardware modules, uh, secure hard mo modules. Uh, what we found there was that uh, memory requirements are like stringent a little bit. 
uh, you would hit like 500 max to two gigs that you can allocate in the, in the enclave, which for many data science purposes is kind of like eh, uh, tough. But then if you really go into federated learning, where you, if your algorithm supports federated learning, then you probably can use those secure enclaves or smaller things like MPC and, uh, and, and full homomorphic encryption. Uh, yeah. Like a lot of this is going on in research. So what we're trying to really first nail is, is make sure that we can run on-prem something um, and we have sufficient guarantees that it actually got run. Um, but we can take that offline because that's kind of a longer discussion. Any other questions for Dimi? Um, if we can, can go back to the slide on unhappy paths, because we went kind of like quickly on it. Which, uh, which the, uh, the unhappy paths, uh, when there's like problems between the consumer and provider. Yep. Uh, how do you, because some of these are going to be happening basically like uh, off chain, so of, of the network, like it's directly between the two. So how do you like, um, what's the dispute resolution process to make sure like uh, to kind of determine which scene, uh, in which case we are and how to solve it uh, for the service execution agreement? Yeah, so, so a typical one, an easy one is like uh, the provider that's going to promise that he's going to do a job puts up stake. Uh, if it timeouts, that stake gets allocated to the consumer. Uh, that's kind of an easy one. Uh, you could put up a competition where you say the first one delivers gets the bounty. Um, again, we're trying to be flexible with that because we don't really know upfront what's going to play out it token ec and eco economically afterwards. Right? So we have to have something flexible that we can play around with. Uh, that's kind of, yeah, if you have interesting like incentive schemas to, to make sure that um, the providers are incentivized to actually do their best, uh, be it through replication, through hardware, through crypto, to proofs or incentives. There's a lot of paths you can go. Um, feel free, yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Dimi. Um, yeah, give it up for Dimitri. So, uh, I want to uh, make a small announcement and then give some um, additional information on the next couple days. So, uh, first, um, uh, Web3 Foundation um, just announced our next um, grant. Uh, where we granted uh, or issued a grant to Sora Mitsu, who's going to be building a implementation of the Polkadot runtime environment in C++. So, this includes, yeah. Um, so this includes um, funding for uh, libp2p in C++, which is um, which we're the only foundation or, or company uh, in the space giving funding for. So that's really exciting. And C++ was chosen by Sora Mitsu because um, a lot of enterprise developers maybe don't know Go or Rust, some of these new decentralized programming languages, but they do uh, know C++. So um, this will help Polkadot become enterprise ready. Um, and we're really excited about the implications for this. So um, yeah, we're, we're announcing that. And uh, in the next couple of days, um, there's gonna be more workshops from the folks that you heard from today. Uh, so Sean is gonna be giving a workshop with Sergey from Parity tomorrow on Substrate um, and walk you through a little bit more than the demo today. So that's at 10 a.m. Um, tomorrow. And then there's also going to be a um, workshop at 12.30 by Edgeward, Dylan. Uh, about smart contracts and DAOs. Um, Evo is going to be live code um, some uh, payment channels in Substrate. And then on day three, we'll hear from Chainsafe again. So Chainsafe, as a reminder, is, is implementing both Ethereum 2.0 and um, they're implementing uh, po the Polkadot runtime environment. So they're doing theirs in Go, uh, Parity's doing theirs in Rust, and now Sormitz is doing theirs in C++. And there's also a JavaScript client. So that's, that's four different teams around the world uh, and about 120, 130 developers all building core Polkadot tech. So that's, that's really important, something we're really excited about. Um, and then, of course, ETH Paris is this weekend. Uh, so you can come hack uh, on a bunch of different technologies there, including Substrate, and there'll be uh, a lot of prizes and so forth for that. So I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, thank, uh, most of all, um, Aseth and um, ECC for having us here. And um, I hope all of you guys have a great rest of your night at all the meetups and stuff. Uh, hope to see you all around. Thanks a lot.
And if you want a t-shirt, there's mediums, large, and XLs. 